We'll get started with our, with our life sim overview. Um, anyone who's taken the uh, consequences training from RMC has seen this uh, very similar presentation to what I'm about to give, but that's okay. It's, all, it's good to get uh, recurrence to, to be able to remember and refresh the brain a little bit. And in this, I'll go into a little bit of the nuts and bolts on how life sims applying some of these concepts. So hopefully we all enjoy this presentation and I think it's a good primer for the week. What is life sim? Well, it's a tool to estimate economic damages and life loss from flooding. I think we're all pretty, pretty comfortable with that. Uh, it has the ability to track individual people. It's an agent-based model. It has a traffic simulation engine built into it so we can actually simulate the warning and evacuation process so that we can understand not only where people started but where people ended up. And it has Monte Carlo sampling with uncertainty around multiple parameters, which means that we get a distribution of potential life loss results, a distribution of potential economic damages, because we're not certain about any of this stuff. When we're looking at fictitious, fictitious hydraulic events that haven't happened, um, we, need to, we need to be able to talk about what we're unsure about, and we need to be able to understand just how unsure we are. Here's a shot of LifeSim. LifeSim is the software itself. On the left, you have your study tree. That's where you input your input data for your analysis. And on the right, you have your map window. The map window is integral to LifeSim. It's very, very helpful and useful for not only building your model and, and, and identifying areas where, where you need to put in more effort, but also in understanding your results, viewing maps, viewing, viewing various um, details. Understand the results that LifeSim is telling us. So the fundamental question that we wanna know, can people get to safety before water arrives, right? If we're doing a life loss analysis, we really need to understand how many people are there that could be at risk. We call those population at risk. How many people are there initially? And then during the evacuation, how many people do we anticipate will be remaining when water arrives? How do we calculate that? That's a really hard thing to estimate. And there's a lot of parameters that go into it. I'll talk about them now. We think about it through this in life soon. We think about it as a warning and evacuation timeline. We break it out by a warning delay. Um, and in warning delay, that's the time from when the imminent hazard occurs, meaning that moment at which the, the dam is, a, is no longer salvageable, right? Hearing more about that this week. There was seepage. They thought they could fix it. They were trying to put bulldozers down. They're trying to cover the seepage. They're trying to stop it. But there was a moment at which they go, this isn't stopping. The dam's going to fail. We need to contact the, the emergency managers who can then issue an evacuation order. That's that imminent hazard identification time. Okay. Once that occurs, that communication has to, has to happen with your emergency manager, right? And that could be instantaneous if they're in the same room, or it could be hours if, if the dam is up in the mountains and there's no cell service, or there's no way for them to communicate, so they have to drive maybe an hour or something like that. So that communication delay can be, uh, can be quite variable. And then warning issuance delay. Once the emergency managers receive that information, how long does it take them to issue that evacuation order? In Olva, it took around 40 minutes or so, 43, 45 minutes, before they issued the evacuation order from when they knew that they needed to issue an evacuation order. Each of these parameters are entered with uncertainty into LifeSim. Okay? So the imminent hazard ID time, in this example, showing one hour prior to one hour after the breach. If we look at this plot, the breach is that hazard occurrence, that vertical dotted line. And so you can see uniform distribution, the warning can occur, sorry, the imminent hazard identification time with zero communication delay and zero issuance delay, warning can occur one hour prior to one hour after, right? Now we start adding uncertainty about these other parameters. Hazard communication delay, say it's uh, between um, half hour to, what was that, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes to a half hour. All of a sudden we see that uncertainty band shift. Right? That's because now we're saying, you know what, that warning is likely to go out a little bit later because of the communication delay. Add in your warning issuance delay, 
you see quite a bit of shift, right? And that's because we'll get into that. Jesse has a presentation later this week or maybe, yeah, I think tomorrow on um, the warning and evacuation parameters that we use in LifeSim. And you'll go into a lot more on that warning issuance delay parameter. Yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. So great, great question. So depends on your level of effort. Um, scalability is important. We have default parameters in LifeSim that are based on empirical data um, that was developed by uh, Dennis Maletti and John Sorensen, who are um, social scientists who focus on natural hazards research in, in, in people's reaction to those hazards. Um, and so we have empirical data of uncertainty based on and for, that you can apply. But then we also have the ability to go in and ask specific questions to emergency managers so that we can get more defined um, uncertainty parameters and parameters specific to that study area. Um, Jesse will go into that in more detail uh, tomorrow. Yeah. All right, so you can see how all these parameters can add up to quite a bit of uncertainty when the warning gets issued. All right, once that warning is issued to the public, how long does it take for that warning to spread throughout the community? In LifeSim, we use a, a, um, a curve function to represent that, where it represents the percentage of population that receive a warning over time. Again, this data was def defined based on empirical evidence from, um, from case histories on how quickly a warning can spread based off of multiple parameters. What type of warning systems? How many warning systems are in place? All these other parameters that influence how quickly we expect that warning to spread. Another thing that affects it is day versus night. At night, it's going to be much harder to wake people up, right? How many of you have um, your phones turned off at night? I know I do. Hopefully, the Amber... All right. Once you've received that warning, so we just did a big shift. I want, to, I want you to know all these parameters were relative to a central source, right? When is that evacuation order going to go out? That's from a central source, that emergency management agency. Now we're talking about a community, right? At a community level, how quickly is that warning going to spread? So we've just done a transition from central source to multiple agents, right? When is an individual person going to get a warning? That's going to be a function of this, of this curve. Um, and then same with protective action. So based off, of, based off of the research that's been done, we can come up with estimates of when somebody gets a warning, how long is it going to take them to take pr protective action to try to evacuate? And that, that effort is, is verifying the threat. That, uh, that information is going out, uh, getting your kids, get, gathering. Good question. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, so, so they're sampled independently in software, but the functions should be defined related, right? So depending on the warning messaging that you're anticipating, that should impact this curve as well. That should impact the, the, what you, how you think people are going to, how quickly to take protective action, right? If the warning message is, is there's likely going to be heavy rains in the next few days um, and, and the dam is likely to overtop, you need to evacuate because flooding is going to occur three to four days from now, that's going to change how quickly people take protective action, right? Like, I have three to four days. I, I have some time. Versus the dam that you live downstream of just failed, you need to evacuate now because the life-threatening flooding is coming your way. That's a very different message, right? And so people are going to react differently. So they're related in terms of how you de develop them. They're all related. But in the software itself, they're sampled independently. Yeah. Previous slide for you. Yeah. Is that, is that inherently based? Is that based on population density or just one variable? It's based off of multiple um, case studies. Case studies where evacuations have occurred and they've gone out afterwards and done surveys and tried to get an estimate of, um, okay, if we're looking at this from after the fact, 
looking at the empirical data, how quickly did the warning actually spread? Yeah. Yeah. Again, uh, Jesse will go over all this in more detail. This evacuation timeline is a whole lecture, so we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail tomorrow. Uh, I'm trying to remember if they all happened in the U.S. or not. I, I don't recall. There might have been some that are international, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. Um, anyway, so, so there's going to be more details on how, how to develop these functions in another lecture. Right now, we're just talking about the functions, what, how they are in life sim and how they're applied. So how are they applied? We know at the community level roughly how, how, um, how quickly the warning is going to spread and how quickly people are going to mobilize based on these functions, right? We have uncertainty about them. We can reduce that uncertainty by going in and getting more information. We can go in and we can talk to the emergency managers, know what types of warning systems they have, know how well prepared they are, and we can develop, we can reduce this uncertainty about our functions. That's knowledge uncertainty, right? We can reduce it with more knowledge. But we don't necessarily know exactly when individuals are going to receive a warning, right? I don't know who in this room would get a warning first if, the, if Lake Berryessa failed and there was a flood coming this way. Or Sim is we take the top curve, we sample it, and, and we get a, a function per iteration. Remember, this is Monte Carlo, so per iteration. Then we sample our mobilization curve. Okay, we look at the structure with two people in it. That structure with two people in it is representative of a percentage of our population. So we sample it, get a value. Warning receives 78 minutes after warning issuance. Okay, so for this structure with two people, the warning is, re they receive a warning 78 minutes after the issuance from the emergency managers. Okay? Then we go over to our mobilization curve. We sample it, get a curve. This, there we go. Come up with our, our variable for our fraction of population, our time. And then for, we're going to say for this iteration, this structure mobilizes 100 minutes after they receive that warning. So they receive a, a warning 78 minutes after issuance, and they mobilize 100 minutes after that. It takes them 100 minutes before they get all their stuff. So in this iteration, for life sim, for this structure, two people will leave the, that structure within a vehicle um, 178 minutes after the warning is issued. That's just on one iteration. That's just one structure. The next iteration, those two people may not evacuate at all. They may evacuate almost immediately. It all depends on where they get sampled along those functions. What this does by sampling per, per evacuating group in the structures is it recreates these functions at the community level. Here's a visual of that, what that looks like. Um, so this is going to be an animation. Uh, you see the houses that are brown right now. When they, as the, the warning spreads throughout the community, um, the, as the houses start receiving warning, people in those houses start receiving the warning, those houses are going to turn yellow. And then once those people take protective action, they'll turn into blue cars and start evacuating out. So you can see how that, that warning is spread. Can, can anybody, anybody have any thoughts on that? Uh, uh, when you're visualizing, I'll go ahead and animate that again. Visualizing that animation, one thing that jumps out to me, and this is a question that always comes up, is the, the houses turning yellow seem pretty uniform. Seems pretty uniformly distributed geospatially, right? And that's what's happening. In life sim, it's not taking into account, um, in the warning diffusion, it's not taking into account environmental cues, and it's not taking into account um, neighbors coming knocking on doors. So in reality, if I receive a warning in my house, my neighbors are then much more likely to get some environmental cues and start finding out information quicker because maybe they'll see me evacuate. Maybe I'll go and start knocking on doors and so on. So that warning diffusion, while it's happening on a, on a community scale, what we would expect, it may not be happening in the same In terms of road loadings. Another important point I want to make here is that this is one iteration, right? So this was one 
one sampling for each structure of when they're going to evacuate. It loads the road network. The next iteration is going to be completely different in terms of how people are getting loaded onto that road network, which can cause different um, patterns in the in the traffic. So in this in this situation, we see quite a bit of traffic down here on the south. Probably going to start building up pretty quick and causing delays. But in the next iteration, maybe that won't occur. It all kind of depends on how that warning diffuses and how people start taking protective action. Which brings us to that next piece, the evacuation, right? We went through the warning process from when the, it's identified that the hazard is going to occur, communicating to emergency managers. Emergency managers issue that evacuation order. People out on the ground are starting to receive, that, receive the evacuation order, deciding whether they want to evacuate or not. Horizontally by road segments, uh, either, either on foot or in a vehicle, or vertically within a structure moving. For horizontal evacuation, how do the agents determine where they're going to go? In LifeSim, we have a set of destinations, and those, the agent or the, the evacuating person or group, they're going to try to find the destination that they can get to the fastest. Not the one that's the closest, the one they can get to the fastest. So part of that process is going to be looking at the road types to get them to all the destinations available, and, and the road types are going to define how quickly they can get there because of the, the free flow speed on those roads. Um, that's done using Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm. If anyone's familiar with that, it's a simple, um, simple optimization routine for, to find uh, the shortest route on a network from any given point. Once they're is determined by this simple function, green shield, uh, modified green shields dual regime model, which essentially is a fancy way of saying the more vehicles there are on the road with you and in front of you, the slower you're going to go. It's a simple speed density relationship. A couple of things I want to point out, though, is that there's a break point. So if you're on a freeway and you have a couple other vehicles on the road with you, that's really not going to impact your speed very much. And so we have this break point. This is, comes out of the U.S. Department of Transportation. They adjusted the original green shields, which just was a simple speed density function, and put in so, some fixes to make it a little bit more, a um, little bit more reasonable. This is all in LifeSim. This is adjustable, uh, and then you can make adjustments and see how it affects your results. All right. So we have LifeSim one-way roads, which is really important for directionality and the ability of somebody to turn around if they reach a flooded road. If you're on a one-way road and that road is becoming flooded, it's probably going to be near impossible to be able to turn around. We see people time and time again getting caught on one-way roads. Uh, in vehicles or on foot, you can define a certain percentage of the population by occupancy type that will evacuate in vehicle versus on foot. So if you have a, a large center where you believe that everyone will just evacuate on foot to a nearby destination, you can set that up. Vehicles may turn around if a road is flooded. So as they're driving along, they come to a flooded road, they have the ability to turn around and try to find a better route. And vehicles can reroute if they reach a traffic jam. How many of you have been driving along and you uh, see a traffic jam and pull up your phone and see, okay, it's gonna be red for the next three miles. Maybe I'm gonna take an exit if I can and try to find a way around it. We've all done that, right? LifeSim is built to try to mimic that, that, that behavior. Um, is that if a vehicle is driving along and it reaches a traffic jam, it's going to potentially attempt to reroute based off of the current loadings of the entire network. The idea there is that everyone's got cell phones, they're all going to have that live traffic information, so they're not going to reroute to another destination as if the roads are empty, they're going to reroute to another destination that they think they can get to the quickest. That's what I would do, I think that's what most people would do in that situation. So. That's one of the unique things about LifeSim is the ability for vehicles to start rerouting and these agents that are on the road to start making decisions to either reroute because they reach a flooded road, go over the flooded road, reroute um, due to traffic, and so on. LifeSim has a, the traffic simulation engine has something called vehicular spillback. This is in your simulation options. It's a, you can go and turn it on or off. And really all this does is it enforces 
that the vehicles um, are constrained to a physical limit of the number of vehicles per road. And the parameter there is effective vehicle length. Okay, so you have your effective vehicle length for cars, it's say 18 to 20 feet, if you consider the length of a vehicle plus a little buffer. Um, and so if that's turned on, spillback's turned on, it's gonna take that effective, effective vehicle length parameter and it will limit the number of vehicles that can, that can occur on any given road segment at any given time. So you get more realistic backup of vehicles on the road segment, as you can see. In previous iterations and in another, um, the only other life loss simulation model that I know of, it just bounds all the vehicles up on a single point. And so you have un unrealistic life loss occurring on road segments that get flooded because there's an unrealistic, unrealistic number of vehicles on it. The spillback option makes that so it's not an issue anymore. It does increase the simulation run times, especially, and it's exponential. So if you have an insanely large population at risk with a really large road network, spillback is just going to make it, make it run that much longer. Um, however, uh, some of the things that I recommend is if you have an issue with, uh, with run times, run your life sim model with spillback turned off for several iterations spare back turned on for a few iterations and see if it really changes the results that much. If it doesn't change the results that much, then consider running with it off if, um, if you, to get more iterations. Yeah. The uncertainty of safe destinations? Or what, how so? Because, you know, they Yeah, when they can get. Yeah, I think I see where you're going. Um, that is something we have on the books for future improvements. Is is applying um, almost it's not like a weight, but like a like a desirable destination. That's gonna some destinations people are getting more likely to go to generally on main freeways and stuff like that. So, um, we saw that in the Orville evacuation with Chico, and there was another route that people could have taken, but it was far less used because everyone's comfortable going north or south on their main roads. So we have looked into doing that, yeah. All right, next, this one's fun. Yeah, you don't have to think about this too much, the, the flow chart, what I wanna bring your attention to is the does the vehicle enter the flooded road? So this is a really neat one. In life sim, as the, as the vehicle's driving along, they come to a flooded road, they don't immediately turn around. The, each vehicle, has a, um, a probability associated with it, a, a value associated, associated with it, of their threshold of what they're willing to try to cross. Um, we realized after version one that, that we, were, we had tons of vehicles that were coming into a road with a, that was under the, the threshold and then turning around, when in reality, we see time and time again from flooding, people losing their life because they ignore warnings, they ignore barriers, they drive around, they drive into flooded roads, and they lose their life because their vehicle loses stability. We wanted to be able to capture that in life sim. So we had a, a person who was working with us at the time, Paul Richter, he's now with HDR. He went through and found a whole, as much research as he could out there, and he found a few papers that were helpful on people's propensity to enter a road with water on it. So it was some of them were surveys of, okay, if a road has, if you think a road has half a foot of water, would you try to pass it, you know, um, a foot of water and so on. And we could take all this information from these questionnaires and these papers and develop some uncertainty distributions about our general population and what people are willing to risk when they come to a flooded road. We apply those in life so and here's how it works. So for a high clearance vehicle, say a truck or a SUV, we have our, our distribution over here, just been turned into a cumulative. We sample that distribution. 63 centimeters on it, they're gonna try to drive through. What this creates, is it creates a situation where people have a, can make bad choices. People can come to a road and their threshold might be pretty high, so they try to drive through, but their vehicular stability is pretty low and they lose stability and potentially lose their life. 
So LifeSim has the ability for people to then make those bad choices and has the ability for people to be incredibly risk averse coming to a road with a couple inches of water and they'll turn around and try to find a different route. Yeah, you have a question? Oh yeah, no problem. I'm glad I stopped you then. All right, um, here's another one. Uh, I don't want to take you know, the, 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 the chart there. You don't, want, you don't have to focus on that too much. We're going to get into the vertical evacuation piece. We just got, got onto the piece talking about how people move around on the roads and get to their destinations. But what about those people who are in a, in a structure? They either couldn't, evacu they couldn't evacuate by, uh, by vehicle or they chose not to. Uh, there's a, one of the major uh, factors in, in people's ability to vertically evacuate is if you have limited mobility or not. If you're able-bodied, you're much more likely to be able to get up on furniture. You're much more likely to be able to get up into an attic, get up onto a roof. So that's a real factor in determining where people can go. Here in this little example, we assume in life sim that everyone can get to up to the top livable floor of their house, of their structure. Um, and then we test if they, can, if they can get up into their attic or not. Even able-bodied folks out there who own a home, not everyone knows that they have an attic or even how to access it. I think everyone knows they have an attic if they have one, but not everyone knows how to access it. And so we want to be able to capture that. Not everyone is going to be able to get into their attic to evacuate. Uh, some people may be stuck on their top livable floor. So if they can't evacuate beyond, they're stuck on the top livable floor. Otherwise, they either go to the attic or to the roof. Um, obviously, their ability to survive is different than depending on if they're out at the roof or top floor, depending on how deep the water gets. So that was it. That was the, the whole process of simulating in life sim from warning issuance all the way through evacuating either vertically or horizontally. If you're evacuating by road, trying to reach a destination to get safety. As they're getting on the road, all these agents, they're interacting with other vehicles, getting slowed down in traffic jams. They're interacting with the floodwaters. This whole time, the flood is propagating through the system, capturing people in their homes, capturing people on the roads. And it's providing us with a way to estimate, okay, here's where we think people are going to start. Here's where we think people are going to end up. And here's how deep, and here's how deep the water is going to be and how fast it's moving where they get caught. That brings us to our next step in life sim. Right? We just talked about the evacuation piece, but how do we get to the actual life loss? How do we get to estimating the actual consequences from this event? We, have, we break out based off of the hydraulic conditions at, that person's, at these people's locations, we break out into low or high hazard. So low hazard is generally calm flood waters. We can, people can generally wade through it. It's pretty safe. Um, Whereas high hazard is the stability of, of the structure or the vehicle or a person on foot has been lost or submergence has been exceeded for a person that can no longer easily keep their head above water. These are considered high hazard situations. Um, and we've been, each person who, who's come into contact with water in the simulation into one of these two bins, either high or low hazard. How we do that for submergence is for those that are in a structure is if if you're at your top livable floor if you're in the structure itself and you're able-bodied do you think that do you think that if water comes up to your chest then you're gonna you're gonna be in a high hazard situation if water came up to right here right now would, would we all be in a high hazard situation none of you would stand up so you would all be underwater all right so you would all be high hazard no, we would get up. You'd all stand up. We'd get up on, on stuff, right? We would try to survive. That's what we do as humans. We try to survive. So we would try to get our heads above water. So with that in mind, if somebody's in a structure and they're able-bodied, that submergence criteria is going to be based off of the depth from the ceiling. And uh, the default is, um, is a triangular distribution with the most likely being one foot from the ceiling. The idea there is that people are going to be able to get up on things. They're going to be able to get their head up above, um, above that water. If they have limited mobility, it's based off of depth from the floor, right? If I'm in a wheelchair, I can't get up on something and, and get my head above that water. So I'm kind of stuck. I'm kind of trapped. So that, therefore, the submergence criteria is based off the depth from the floor. 
if somebody's on the roof, there is no ceiling, so it just becomes a, a function of depth um, above the top top of the of the roof. However, if you have enough water to go four feet above the top of the roof, I'm pretty sure that structure is going to be collapsed, which is goes into another another category, which is stability. Anyone seen this plot? Has everyone seen this plot? I think I've you probably all seen me present this. You all know that each dot on there represents a person that fell over in a flume. Yep. So for those of you who are not familiar, this plot represents a, a, a whole bunch of research that looked at how how capable people are of being able to keep their footing when water is rushing through. So they have people stand in a flume, run water through, and then they march when the depth and velocity was, exceeded their ability to stay standing and they fell down. Um, we use this information to, do, to define the stability criteria in life sim for people who are on foot caught by flooding. In structures, we have developed um, default parameters for a structural stability criteria for manufactured housing, wood buoyant housing, wood housing that's been attached to the foundation, wood anchored, masonry, and then uh, engineered structures. Each of these have a different capability of standing up to withstanding flooding. And if a structure collapses in flooding, the people inside are considered high hazard. If the structure maintains its, its stability, then it comes down to the submergence criteria. Just a little, uh, little write-up of, of what they are. Uh, and then this is an example of a, a paper that shows um, a various stability criteria for wood frame structures that they have analyzed from various studies. And you can see that there's a lot of research out there that looks at stability of uh, structures in terms of flooding. And so we're able to pull on that to develop functions with uncertainty that we can apply to LifeSim. How does that work? How does LifeSim do it? So in LifeSim, we have these st stability or yeah, these stability functions. And as the simulation is going, first, the step one is the curve sample. If anyone's not familiar with that, anyone, anyone familiar with curve sampling, how that works? Okay, so we have a function with uncertainty here, right? Uh, this black line is our, our most likely, and the blue area represents our uncertainty about that, that function. Curve sampling means I'm going to take a random parameter, random number, say it's, it's 0.25, and I'm going to apply that to every ordinate along this function. To, to sample that uncertain variable, which means that the new curve is going to be about 0.25 along this uncertain distribution. If I had sampled 1, it would be at the max, right? The curve would be at the max. If I had sampled 0, you'd be sampling the minimum of that curve. In this case, it's a, assume we're sampling about 0.25, so it curve samples in there. It does that for every structure. And that's important because when you're looking at tracked housing, you would assume, okay, they're all built to the same specifications and that water's gonna flow through and if one structure collapses, the other next one's gonna collapse if it has the same depths and velocities. Not necessarily true. There's natural variability from structure to structure, even when they have the same materials, just in the wood itself and how they, they attach to the foundation. There's little things that can happen that can cause one structure to be able to withstand the flooding and the other to have some, some issue that was unforeseen that causes it to collapse. All right, so we sample the function, and then we assess the instantaneous depths and velocities throughout that simulation that occurred at that structure. If at any time that instantaneous depth and velocity exceeds that function, then it's assumed that structure is collapsed. Otherwise, it assumes the structure is stable. Pretty simple, right? Same thing for vehicles, vehicle stability. Vehicles are the most or least safest place to be when you're in a flood? Least. Why? Stability criteria is lower. That's right. Vehicles are go, go unstable really quickly. So you can, if I'm on foot, I'm likely to be able to withstand flooding a lot better than a vehicle right next to me because vehicles float. The tires float. And so vehicles tend to lose stability much quicker, start floating, and get pushed all around, pushed into deeper waters, pushed into much, much more hazardous conditions. We took whatever existing research is out there and developed some default functions for vehicle stability for high and low clearance vehicles um, to, to use in the software. Here's a shot of the default functions that we use. Uh, if, 
If you look over here, the depth uh, is a bit different here between the two. Why is that? What, what, why, why, is, um, why are these depths? I, I know it's in meters, so none of us can do that conversion in our head. But the depth of the, is about one foot or so for low clearance and, and a bit higher for high clearance. It's, it's very, the reason for that is because of the wheel wells, right? So really, once the water gets up above the wheel wells, that's when your vehicle really starts losing that stability because it's hitting that bubble, that bubble of your car, and it starts floating. All right. We've talked about stability and submergence. Going back through, I like to reiterate what we've done. Um, we've went through a whole warning and evacuation process. We got to our final location of where the people are who are now exposed to that flooding. You're going to hear these terms a lot, population at risk and exposed population. The population at risk is those who were there who could have potentially got flooded if they never moved. The exposed population are the people that actually got exposed to that flooding. How do we determine fatalities? We've determined their hazard been by their stability and their submergence. But for fatalities, we use these two functions, high hazard and low hazard function. Every dot on that curve represents a case history of a group of people who were caught in flooding and the fatality rate of that group. So as we're going along, as, as here's an example. Um, for, for Hood, Texas in 2018, uh, nine of 12 soldiers lost their life because that, that vehicle, lost stability, was washed into deeper water, high hazard situation, nine of the 12 lost their life, that becomes that fatality rate for that point. Another example, uh, St. Mary's Orphanage in 1900, um, only three survivors. Uh, on, it was a pretty, pretty sad and scary incident, but that represents a point on this curve. Tom Sock Dam failure. Home was completely wiped from the foundation. The family was, was, was knocked outside. It's, it's cold, it's winter. Somehow they miraculously all survived. Middle of the night, no warning. So we want to be able to capture the reality that we have a lot of uncertainty on if somebody is going to survive or not if they're put into a high hazard situation. People are, can be pretty resilient, and some pretty amazing circumstances can occur that can allow for survival. I always like to bring up the Teton Dam example. There's two, two fishermen directly downstream of the dam. The dam fails. They have no warning. They're smashed by a 40-foot wall of water. One of them survives. Amazing. It's a, it's a miracle. But it happens, and we want, to be able to, we want to be able to capture that with these functions. So how does it, this is a low, low, low hazard function. A um, couple examples, somebody who uh, stepped in, in some floodwaters and got electrocuted. This is a situation where it was calm floodwaters. The water itself wasn't causing the issue, but the electrical current within the water did. Another example is somebody who was in calm waters, lost their footing, slipped, fell, fell into a deeper area and lost their life. So with the low hazard function, what I really want you to focus on is this x-axis. Look at how small those numbers are. So while we have found instances where people lost their life in, in low hazard conditions, the vast majority of cases are that people survive, is that everyone survives. All right, so how does this function work in life sim? I talked about it, talked about a little bit how it was developed. We went through, and it's based on empirical data. Each point represents a group of people in that situation. But how does life sim treat it? So, for a group of people that were captured, or that were, say, captured by flooding, they've been in their structure, that structure lost stability, they're in a high hazard situation, there's three people, how do we determine the, the fatalities? Step one is we sample along the x-axis. We say, okay, these people are in a high hazard situation, they represent one of these groups, or something like one of these groups on this function. So we sample along the x-axis to get our relative frequency of exceedance to get a fatality rate. Now this group of three people has a fatality rate of 0.75. Okay? That doesn't mean everyone, that doesn't mean that two out of three, sorry, three out of four always die. It just means that that value is what's then used to sample. So then goes through each of those three people, samples a random number, and if it's above 0.75, they survive. Below 0.75, they lose their life. What that means is that iteration to iteration, they may, even though it's a 75% um, fatality rate, they may all survive. 
they may all lose their life. But on average, over our whole population, we're going to be representing this curve. That's the light loss compute. Hopefully, are there any questions? I'm sorry. Sorry, no. This is per evacuating group. It's not per structure, and it's not um, it's it's not applied to the structure. So if the structure is a uh, is a uh, is considered high hazard, loses stability. But say there's a hundred people in there. That isn't necessarily that you have one group of 100 people, you have multiple groups, especially if it's an apartment complex, right? If it's an apartment, you have multiple groups, multiple familial units. And each of those units samples off that curve independently. So three, so you set your group size in life sim per structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once you're high hazard, it doesn't matter how you got there. Once you're high hazard, you're high hazard and you're, you're using these functions. It doesn't matter if you got there from vehicle, in your structure, how you got there. Yeah. 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 It does. It does. There's there's a parameter in life sim where you define um, the percentage of your calls that are low clearance versus high clearance. Huh? How do you know? Well, if I if I live in Davis, the vast majority of vehicles are low clearance. Okay. If I live uh, up in the up in the the Sierra Nevada mountains up near Tahoe, a lot more vehicles are going to be high clearance. So it's it's regional. By default, it's 50-50. Yeah. For the low hazard fatality rate curve, mm -hmm. is fatality considered indirect or would you direct? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, we would consider those direct. Uh, indirect is a different bin. We did not include indirect in these functions. So if somebody's in water and they get electrocuted, we consider that direct fatality because they were in direct contact with the water. Um, indirect would be if if you're you're in your house that loses power and you're on life support, or you're on some type of thing where you need power and you lose your life from that. Or if you're evacuating and as you're evacuating away, maybe you have a heart attack or some something happens, that would be considered indirect because you lost your life due to the event, just not directly caused by the event. Yes, like a car crash, exactly. Okay. Um, Direct economic damages are calculated in life sim as well. This uses the same method that's used in um, HCFIA, FDA, and several others. The idea is simple. You have a debt damage function with uncertainty for your structure. And then based on what the depth is at that structure, you calculate a percent damage. And based on the value of that structure and the percent damage, you come up with a total loss. Make sense? Life sim is a little bit unique, however, and that it adds on another layer of complexity here and it takes into account structural stability. So if a structure is collapsed, it's gonna assume 100% loss of that structure as opposed to using a depth damage function which may, at, may top out at 50%. So you can get a little bit more realistic estimates of, of your economic damages by taking into account total loss of structures. Lesson also does agricultural damages. So if you uh, care about doing agricultural damages, this is generally more pertinent to the mid Midwest. Um, you can enter in your agricultural grid, generally from NAS Agricultural Statistics Survey, and then define information about your crops, um, when the first planting date is, second planting date, crop type, um, how much it costs to harvest, how much you get for, for, for selling it, and you can use, define some timing about when your hydraulic event occurs, and you can estimate agricultural damages. Switching gears a little bit on um, how LifeSim has been applied. LifeSim has been applied in multiple places throughout the world. Uh, one of these I'd like to focus on is Whittier Narrows Dam in California. I like to focus on that because the population at risk is over a million, and the evacuation is horrendous because it's Los Angeles. 
there aren't many other models that can, uh, I, there really aren't any other models that can run um, a life loss compute on such a large uh, population at risk, especially with an evacuation model. Another one is Mosul Dam in Iraq. Um, this is potentially one of the largest consequence um, dam failures that in history, if it occurred. Uh, estimates are, are in the tens, hundreds of thousands, even up to potentially a million, depending on the conditions. So a really scary situation. The population at risk is so large that none of the other models at the time could even run. They'd all go out of memory. Um, so Hessen was the only one that could be applied there to give us some, some results with confidence. This is a fun one. I'm sure you've all seen this, but you've probably forgotten. Um, this was out of Australia. So a group out of Australia, Hark is the, the company, they sent me an example. They're like, hey, what the heck's going on? As the warning goes out later and later, our life loss is going down. That's counterintuitive, right? You would think as warning goes out later and later, life loss would go up because you have less warning time. Well, what was happening was in their simulation, all, you have this huge shopping center. It has like 1,000 people in it. All these people are evacuating north out of the shopping center and eventually getting caught on the road and then trapped in these high, high risk situation right here and uh, causing life loss. Well, as warning went out later and later, the people in that shopping center weren't evacuating, right? Because water was already there. The water was on the road. So they were like, well, we're just going to stay in the shopping center. It's a multi-story concrete structure that doesn't lose stability or, or submergence. So they were perfectly fine. So as the warning went out later and later, life loss was going down because there were fewer people getting out on roads and getting caught. Kind of interesting. And we'll see, I see this in quite a few models where, where there's a little spike in life loss that occurs at a certain time when the road network is fully loaded and water comes through. That causes, so there is a situation where it's actually better to not evacuate because structures are much more safe than vehicles. I, don't, I can't imagine being an emergency manager making that call, but... It happens. All right, we're going to end off with a, a little application example here in Oroville. Everyone's familiar with Oroville? See a lot of nodding heads. Yep, um, that's pretty close to here. It's, uh, it's driving distance. If anyone wants to rent a car and drive up there, it's the tallest dam in North America. Come on, that's pretty exciting. Who isn't excited about that? Uh, 2017, as we all know, they had, they had a bit of an issue. They, uh, they opened up their emergency spillway because their regular spillway had damage. Um, that emergency spillway started causing some severe erosion that was leading back towards the emergency spillway. There was a concern that if it reached the, uh, the, the emergency spillway here, it would start unraveling these monoliths and cause all this water to start flowing down and flood a bunch of people downstream. That was a concern. Thinking about that warning evacuation timeline, that notification around 3.30 in the afternoon where they're like, oh man, I'm getting real concerned about this, this erosion. Has anyone told the sheriff about this? He needs to be aware that, that we might need to evacuate. Sheriff happened to be in the room at the time and goes, hey, what? What's going on? We need to, we need to really care about this. Uh, so they started talking about it. About 20 minutes later, they decided, hey, the sheriff's like, unless anyone says anything, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to issue an evacuation. No one said anything. So he's like, okay, let's start the process. So communication delay, zero, right? Um, and then once they decided to evacuate, decided to, to do the evacuation, that was 20 minutes later, about 30 minutes after that, they actually issued that first warning. So we talked about that, that warning issuance delay from hazard notification, zero communication delay. It was like, what, 50 minutes? 50 minutes before they issued the evacuation order. So that, that delay is important. And that's something that, that, I don't think we think about intuitively is that once the emergency manager receives information that, that you need to evacuate, it's still going to take a lot of time before they actually issue that evacuation order. And depending on how well prepared they are and how well they know about this potential hazard, that time can vary quite a bit. All right, some of the evacuation orders that were sent out, that warning messaging is really important. Uh, we did a survey after, after the evacuation. This happened to be a prime example, right? Because it was an evacuation of a fairly large population, over 100,000 people. And the glory of this is that it didn't happen. There was no flood. Nobody lost their life. Everyone came back home. Everyone's homes are still there. So we could send out a survey to all these addresses and have people give us
survey results. Uh, this is kind of fun. I like to point this one out. Non-evacuation reasons. So quite a few people didn't evacuate. One of the most um, popular responses for why they didn't evacuate was because of um, traffic. They looked on the news. They saw there was heavy traffic everywhere. They're like, ah, screw it. Whatever happens, happens, and they don't evacuate. So that's something that really impacts uh, people's choice and if they're going to evacuate or not. So how did we do? How did LifeSim do? Observed uh, from the survey, on average, it took people about three hours from when they left their home to reach their destination. LifeSim estimated around 2.6, so pretty good. On a whole, LifeSim did pretty good at estimating times that people are going to take. Uh, the range, seven minutes to 50 hours. 50 hours was probably this person driving a few states over. Maybe they were visiting family, so obviously we need to we need to control for the, the bound, the edge cases. But uh, generally, we did pretty good in the range and the median, we were solid. So on average, LifeSim did very well at estimating how long it was going to take people to take. How about where they are? Is it estimating where they are uh, appropriately? Looking at um, Oroville, Oroville, uh, most people are evacuating north towards Chico. Some people are evacuating south. Uh, notice out of Oroville, this bright blue line, those were all vehicles backed up. Looking at uh, uh, traffic, live, live news coverage during the time, it's backed up all the way from Chico to Oroville. So we captured that pretty well. Down south of Yuba City, so there's a, a few different routes that all converge to one going south. We capture that pretty well too on when where that uh, traffic is occurring and where those traffic congestion points are occurring, which is very important. This provides really valuable information for emergency managers because then they know they can take this and then apply it to various emergency management strategies to determine which one's going to be the best bang for the buck in terms of getting people out fast. So we can then take that model and apply it. Um, they were thinking about doing like a zoned evacuation strategy. We can apply that in LifeSim to determine if it's actually going to be effective or not. A little spoiler, probably not. Or this is a, this area is a, unfortunately has like only four reasonable evacuation routes out, and there's a lot of people. So no matter how we slice and dice it, it's not a pretty picture unless you start adding in some more evacuation routes. Uh, that's it for the LifeSim overview. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do the check on learning with you guys. So LifeSim has the following functionality. Select all that apply. Agent-based modeling, traffic simulation engine, it makes coffee, and it has geospatial mapping. Anybody? Is integral to LifeSim because everything's geospatial. And so, so LifeSim does have a geospatial mapping component. Good. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, we're working on it. I recently took to, a trip to Europe and, and they do copy way better over there. So maybe I can somehow work that into our laptops or something. <laughs> All right, next question. LifeSim attempts to simulate the evacuation process to estimate where people will be when water arrives. True or false? Good. Are you going to be able to answer that correctly by Thursday? Okay, good. All right, LifeSim has only been applied in the United States within the Corps of Engineers. True or false? Good. You know, this one was a lot easier when LifeSim was a pretty young piece of software because I was like, I don't know, but no. Okay. That's it. That's uh, what I have for the LifeSim overview. Hey, yeah. The question was uh, the the, the life sim example is that uh, verification or application? Yeah, there's an application. It's pretty easy. It's pretty pretty heavily down there for their dam risk assessments. Yeah. Um, life sim doesn't like have to like program. It's 
their children's goals. Um, and I think it's good to play a role with the children that they're with. Yeah. In that St. Mary's orphanage example, the kids that don't have like the things that the children are more risk. And so I guess like how we see the not for examples to even just like, okay, that was kind of like one off, but usually adults like do help. Yeah. No, that's a good question. So, so Lysim doesn't doesn't de deviate between young children and adults. And the idea is that if there's a young child, a young child, then there's going to generally be at least one adult to kind of help them. But we've seen multiple cases where a you know an unfortunate young child will be pulled from the arms of of the parent or. The parent trying to care for the child also gets sucked in because they were also trying to help the child. So that. We do see that um, in the St. Mary's Orphanage, they actually tied tied all the children together, the nuns, to try to keep them all together and keep them safe and ended up backfiring. But at the same time, we see a whole bunch of situations, I would say probably far more, where parents are putting their kids up on the top of a building or putting their kids in a place where they can survive much easier. So that's something that we know exists, but there just isn't enough information to be able to say if it's a positive or a negative on a whole. Yeah.